All right, we're here. <laughs> oh, Lance is here too. All right. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, I hear you, but I can't hear Stuart. Stuart, your mic is muted. Yeah. Oh, no. There you go. Uh, producer engineer, Stuart Lerman, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Recording studio, the mute button, right? The mute button. Hey, Lance, good to meet you. Good to meet you Hi, Lance. how are you? Yeah, where, where, where are you right now? I'm in Atlanta. Atlanta, fantastic. We're all over the place. And Cheryl, where are you? I'm in Portland right now, Oregon. Portland, wow. Oregon. Nice. Yeah. Amazing. So we're all over the place. Anyway, here we go. This is so great. Even uh, Johnny and I have asked our great buddy, Steve Rosenthal, to, um, there he is, Stevie. What are you looking at? The magic shop. To, what a door. To help us uh, put together a, a bunch of people who are uh, like-minded and come from a similar areas of uh, music curation and restoration and uh, archiving and box sets and bringing great stuff back to the world that once was in the world. And Steve and Steve Adabo and Steve Rosenthal, we're gonna get Steve, we're gonna get Steve out all fucking day. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm gonna I'm gonna go, John, if it's okay, I'm gonna go to Rosenthal and Adabo. No more Steve tonight. That's okay. fine. And yeah. I would thinking, I would change my first name to Steve just to make it easier. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, Steve Rosenthal, thank you so much for putting this together. And um and so might you want to just kind of tell us how you thought everyone would kind of weave in to? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. And I, I asked a, a group of friends to, to sort of come on uh, so that people could get a general idea of all the different parts, moving parts that you have to execute in order to take an artist or a record company collection and get them from the point of first viewing them all the way to the point where the public can hear them and see them. If it's a box set or, or, or a CD, or if it's on the DSPs, then just hear them. So I, I put together a really great uh, collection of, uh, of, I think every one of you has, has a Grammy, right? I think you're all Grammy winners um, for, for doing the work that they do. Um, and so uh, I, I just for to introduce myself, uh, I'm Steve Rosenthal. I used to own uh, the Magic Shop on Crosby Street for what was it, 400 years or something? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, since I was forced to close in 2016, I have continued uh, the preservation part of my work. And I have a business called Mars, which is the Magic Shop Archive and Restoration Services. And Michael Graves on your screen, he's my partner in LA. And we do preservation work and archiving work and, and uh, mixing and restoration for archival projects. So uh, there you go. So why don't I introduce people and then they can give you a little chat. So first here's my really good friend, Cheryl Puelski. And she's in Portland, and she can give you a little chat about what she has has been doing. Hey, everybody. Um, thanks, Steve, for uh, asking me and everybody. Uh, it's really fun to be here. I love talking tunes and restoration mm -hmm. and mastering and whatnot. <laughs> and I can see right now it's, it's me and the guys again. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's wearing a black T-shirt, though. Where's your uniform? What do you mean? <laughs> I am uh, presently, I'm a, a co-founder and co-owner of Omnivore Recordings, Omnivore Entertainment Group. Uh, we got started about 10 years ago. Before that, I spent a dozen years of my young life at Capitol um, and uh, did some work for Concord and iTunes and Rhino after that. And uh, in about 2010, uh, three other industry vets and I decided uh, we'd sort of had it being inside, um, you know, the label system. And we just decided that uh, we could lower the overhead and make a go of it on our own. And so we've been doing that since 2010. 
uh, they keep trying to kill us <laughs> and we just ah. keep coming back. <laughs> so that's me. Hi. Right on. Um, fabulous. So next to you on the screen is uh, the amazing Steve Adabo. Um, and uh, Steve, why don't you tell the, the folks a little bit about what you do at Shelter Island? Hey, um, thanks, Steve. Um, hard to believe I had the studio open for 30 years and um, I'm still trying to figure out the next phase because now, you know, we've been dealt a wild card. We don't even know, you know, can't even see past three weeks. But anyway, you know, it started out innocently enough with a bunch of equipment and uh, after having a big hit with Suzanne Vega back in the 80s, and I bought the, all the equipment from Celestial Sounds, formed the studio, first had it in my basement here in my house in Shelter Island where I am right now, where I've been hiding out. And after two years, moved it back to New York City. And that from there on, it was like 30 years and it, it became a, a nice overdub room. You know, we weren't that big to do big tracking dates, but uh, mixing and a lot of great engineers came through. through. And, uh, you know, more recently now, we moved to more, 15 years ago, we had to move to 27th Street, had to move the whole thing. And, you know, it's been a nice steady flow. And, and about the past five years or so, I've been doing a lot of, mixing for Sony and Legacy and a lot of the Bob Dylan box sets. And, um, you know, it just keeps going. I, I sometimes wonder how I've kept it going. And I, 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 uh, I uh, think about my refined sense of denial and that I just keep going. And I don't really know where it's going to go, but somehow I've managed to keep it going for the years. And hopefully we'll keep it going. Yeah, man. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, and next to Steve is Michael Graves, who's out in Altadena, California, and Michael's a mastering and restoration engineer extraordinaire. And Michael, why don't you tell a little bit about what you've been doing and working on? Oh, we've been working on? Um, or, know, you know, you know, just a little background so people could get to know you a little bit. Um, I started off around 2000, just as a hobby. Um, changed, had uh, various other jobs, but this was just something I thought uh, the idea of audio restoration, taking an old um, crunchy recording, either an old acid tape. My mom, my mom had an old acid tape that always fascinated me as a kid. She went into a little booth back in the in the 40s and recorded this song. And I always had this little seven inch, 78 RPM. And it just seemed really cool to me that my mom's voice is on there. So that when I when the technology came around to start removing some of that noise, I just I just I just dug it and I went into it um kept working at it and then i got hooked up with lance down down below here um he had he had a label and um what was the first project we did what was a funnel tone did the phonotone and and the first 78 project we did was the how low can you go that's right that's right yeah um but we we hooked up in atlanta and then you know just one thing led to another and then i do you know i do a lot of work with cheryl um steve so it's it's really it's just crazy that i started this thing off as a hobby in my basement and now i'm living in la and i've, I've got a few grammys over here that's right awesome nice so uh maybe you should introduce lance because <laughs> you know you guys have been working together well lance while. lance is great so really um What's so cool about Lance is the first project out of the gate, he gets a Grammy nomination for. What did you spend like four years on this thing? It, it was the Goodbye Babylon box set. Right. And uh, I didn't, we didn't, you know, it's funny. We had classes in Georgia State together. We both had um, business degrees. We didn't know each other at all. But after, after the fact, we realized we were in the same class together. That's right. But he did that on his own. And then Lance, you, you, <laughs> you can tell your own story better oh, no, than I can. Everything you're saying is accurate. Um, we, uh, I remember we connected um, on the audio front at the Rialto Theater. It was um, That's right. mm -hmm. a woman named Leslie who worked there. And she uh, said you had restored the Johnny Mercer collection that they had at the- That's uh, right. Theater. Yeah, and I was uh, also doing, so I was, you know, I was trying to figure out a place for myself. It's either going to be commercial or is it going to be archival? So I did a big preservation of all the Johnny Mercer archives at Georgia State. And that's how we got hooked up. That's right. That's right. No, and um, yeah, I mean, the first project we did uh, that does the digital is um, it's my wife and myself, April. And uh, uh, when we were still dating, we, we produced the Goodbye Babylon set together. 
And now we're here almost, uh, let's see, 17 years after it came out. And we're up to about 75 titles that we've produced. Um, a huge influence on me was the Anthology of American Folk Music, which um, Smithsonian Folkways reissued in 97. And it sort of led me, uh, you know, sort of down this, it, there you go, my <laughs> um, like the the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> But uh, that, that set really had a big impact on me and it sort of shaped uh, um, what I saw reissues as, is like these sort of transportive uh, potential, uh, potentially transported devices. And, uh, and Mike's been doing our audio restoration mm -hmm. work for, um, I, I guess since the, the Formatone set, which was 2005. Mm -hmm. So we've been working with Mike for about 15 years. Wow. You know, great to have everyone and meet everyone, but I just wanted to say that there are three people who we invited today who, um, who we're gonna miss having here. And uh, Don Fleming, mm -hmm. who I'm sure everyone knows, and uh, Terry Landy from APCO, yeah. and, Ed, Ed, and Ed Stasium, who is uh, working on this, you know, this Ramones box. And, uh, and all three of them send their regards and wish they could be here. And two of them couldn't be here because they're busy. Mm -hmm. Now, so, which leads me to, so like John and I and Steve and Steve probably like people who have been in the recording, the current recording world know that we're going through a big change here and we're not quite sure where it's going and when we're coming back. And also, also Adabo, Steve is a, a performer. So that's a whole other issue that, but, but, but it just kind of occurred to me that like Terry, and Fleming couldn't be here because they're busy. Now, is that, that's a great thing. That's people, it comes down to, and, and they're busy archive. They're busy doing, you know, catalog stuff and with deadlines. And are you guys, is anyone finding that there's more to do now because there's less new content and people need to really hear some of that great old stuff that may not be in our world currently, um, but, and maybe it's too hard, it's too soon to know if that in fact is what is going on. But I would think that archiving stuff right now and bringing stuff out from the past, especially stuff that is rare. I mean, there's like a lot of you guys do very famous records, bringing back and, you know, records that we might know, but, but reintroducing them in a different way. But you also have like, what's really great is it like the old stuff that you bring out really appears like new stuff because most people haven't heard it. So I, I, like, is there more of a deep dive now to go for stuff that people haven't heard? You know, on the, Cheryl and Lance can probably talk on the production side, but for Steve Rosenthal and I on the archiving side, we, we also, we, Mar, what he mentioned earlier, uh, Mars and Mars LA, and we work with a lot of estate archives. Uh, and so we're getting, we're seeing a lot of that. We saw that from the beginning. Um, it's a, yeah. I guess it's a good opportunity to turn around and look at what you've done and, and maybe try to preserve some of this stuff. But, so yeah, in I that respect, we've artists. been just super busy. I think with the artists in quarantine and, and, you know, and it gives them an opportunity to go to storage and sort of take a peek at what it is that they have. And, and so, yeah, Michael and I have uh, been working on a number of, of large asset projects, and, which, oh, which started around this time. What's the percentage, Steve, what's the percentage of people who are living to people who, like when you say estates, does that imply that, that they're no longer with us? Uh, yeah, I guess that probably we do about 50% people are, who are not here anymore and probably 50% with artists that are still here. Right. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I guess estate's not really the right word in that yeah. case because mostly with them, we're dealing with their lawyers. Or, or, band, or a band, their managers. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, I don't think things have gotten busier because of the pandemic. 
um, you know, new, there's, we're still in, you know, we're, we're in the middle of the year. So there's projects that we're probably finishing up at the beginning of the year that'll still come out that were new recordings. Mm. Um, I'm just busy because I'm busy. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, besides having my label, I, I also consult. So, um, you know, it's, it's harder. And I, I do I consult um, with some of the major still as Steve, you do as well. I think a bunch of us do. Um, it's hard for them because they're not in the office. You know, they're working remotely for the first time. So I'm waiting longer on clearances because all the files, all the legal files are there and stuff. So that that stuff has slowed down, I think, across the board. Right. Um, my busyness is coming from something different. Right. And I'm not that busy, but the, um, you know, I I'm, I'm actually was in the studio yesterday for the first time starting a project we had hoped to do in March, you know, so things are kind of been backed up couldn't get the tapes out of Sony. And yeah. uh, so, so basically, you know, they finally got the tapes to me last week. And I was like, I went to my patch bay and I couldn't figure out why I couldn't hear my tape machine. It'd been that long, you know, since <laughs> I've been in the studio and I was all oh, right, they're the patch points. And then, it, you know, it was, it was like, what the heck, you know? Um, so uh, yeah, so it, that's been slow, but I think there's a lot coming down the pike. It seems like for at least, yeah. at least, you know, I've got a few things, that have been backed up and hopefully, you know, we'll you know, I think most of the historical labels have been very brave. I say most, there are some that haven't been, but most of the historical la labels that I've been working with have been brave and I've been, you know, continuing to work. It's sort of an act of faith. If you think about it, you know, mm -hmm. there are no record stores really. Right. I mean, and uh, thankfully I think Amazon has started to let you bring new product back into the warehouse. But there was that couple of months time where they weren't even letting new product into the warehouse, right? Because basically yeah. they had to give us Cheerio boxes. And well, yeah, music wasn't essential. So I get it, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, but most of the, the historical labels have been really brave about continuing on and continuing through their projects. And it's very admirable because they don't, there's no guarantees for what's on the other side of this, you know? Um, and, and so uh, th my feeling is, is that uh, it has, uh, my work has continued at, at a pretty similar clip to what it was before the insanity started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, <clears throat> the reason why I, I kind of like went off on that little tangent was I, and I'm not sure if we can talk about this or not, but last year, Steve, you played me some stuff that um, was from a deceased artist. Okay, we can't talk about it. I'm not going to mention it. <laughs> but, but here, what are you doing? What are you fucking doing? No, but here's my point. Here's my point. It, it's not out yet, but it was new music to me. Right. It was. It well, yeah, was I mean, I could tell. I mean, yeah, at this point, I'm, I'm happy to tell you who it was, say who it was. I played some uh, unreleased Les Paul music that that uh, I've been curating and working on for a number of years now, and that's what I played for Stuart. And, and it was it was it was kind of mind blowingly great, but it really hit me as like had Steve not told me who it was, that I would have went. This is like the best record that I've never <laughs> like. Why ha why don't I know this record? Yep. And so really, th th that's why I was asking about the difference between archiving stuff like like also like, you know, you guys do Rolling Stones and and Stevie, you do Bob Dylan and and those are records we know. And then we get to hear in a different way. But the thing that really is amazing about what you guys are doing is you're archaeologists out there finding stuff that none of us have heard before and especially well, maybe, you know my michael and cheryl have done two of these amazing hank williams boxes wow with uh, with wow. stuff that uh, music that people had never heard before so maybe the two of them want to chat a little bit a bit about that that's more like what you're sort of talking about unheard music yeah from an iconic artist we like finding a lot of that you know like everything from the Gene Clark sings for you, which was a publishing acetate that, uh, you know, the, the, the beauty of the restoration and mastering folks here is that, you know, I, I can, 
wish and hope and pray that I could bring these things out into the world that haven't been heard before, but without the technology and without my coup. Oh, there you go. I thought I had a copy of the Gene Clark. I was going to show you. <laughs> you were deep diving for it. I was like, Wait. yeah. So, some of this stuff, though, it's um, it's it's so damaged that you know it it's 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 hard to bring back to life. And um, with with Mike now, I've been able to release quite a few of these things. Um, you know, we went through and and found every last piece of tape on Big Star's Third and put together a box set of that. Wow, and, that's great. You know, Jim, Jim Dickinson left those tapes out in the middle of the yard, it seemed like for 40 years, you know, and, um, you know, we were able to, to um, sort of snatch it back from the dust heap of history, <laughs> you know. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's one of my favorite things to do is to find stuff that, you know, at, like, add a page or a chapter to an artist, um, you know, discography or, or biography that people didn't know about before. Um, that's big fun, you know, and, and I couldn't do that if it wasn't for, um, you know, the Mikes and the Steves and the Steves and, <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, we, we, we do that a lot. And um, it's, it's kind of baked into our, our business plan. Hey, hey, Cheryl, I know you guys have done, um, you did this Harry Nilsson project yeah and so that was what was this uh, that was unfinished music that he had lying around yeah um before he sadly passed too early for sure um he was cutting all kinds of stuff and couldn't you know the labels just didn't care um but uh mark hudson and my partner brad rosenberger um selected the what they felt were the best of, of those last sessions and Mark finished them up. Amazing. Wow. Yeah, I yeah. heard two of them, they're great. Yeah, it turned out great. It turned <laughs> out really good. Um, I didn't mean to gloss over the Hank, but um, you know, Hank's, Hank's another one, you know, when uh, a, a friend of ours um, found uh, some acetates, uh, no, they were um, transcriptions. Transcription. Yeah, 16 yeah, inch that, transcriptions. Yeah, yeah, that nobody had known about and um, you know, for, to to have Mike be able to work from that original source uh, uh, on a Hank Williams project that nobody knew about, including the estate. You know, isn't that crazy? That that a record. <laughs> this isn't. This wasn't hidden away in some vault somewhere. Oh, these were granted. These yeah, were records nice. that were sent out. <laughs> that's not it. That's a different one. <laughs> but these were records right. that were sent out to radio stations. But it's just crazy to me that no one has ever picked this thing up and said, "Hey, this is." This is important. Right. Well, it took a long time for folks to play it. Our, our friend George basically said, you know, because the labels had been printed, um, he thought it was just, you know, canned, you know, maybe it was MGM material and they put some commercials in between it. But then he dropped the needle and, and went, hmm, this is not, this is not what I thought it was. So, um, you know, that's, it's exciting for me when I get those calls saying, Hey, uh, you want to do a Hank Williams project? <laughs> you know, like, hmm, I think so. <laughs> so, but yeah, the, the Hanks turned out really well. So wait, how did you come upon them or? A friend of ours, um, George um, Gamark, uh, who worked in radio down in Texas. He's a big collector, like we probably all are. And he buys collections of, of records and he found these transcription discs in there. And he called our friend Colin Escott who in turn called me and the estate, and then we put it together from there. Um, but he had had them for a while and he just hadn't listened to them. And that was actually Cheryl and I's first project together. Yeah. Awesome. You call them transcription discs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean for the people who don't really know what that means, like me? Mike, you wanna do that one? The transcription discs were, correct me if I'm wrong, they were, the, they were either pressed, sometimes they're pressed, sometimes they're acetates, but these were records that were so you tune into radio, you hear a radio show. Sounds like maybe it's being broadcast from down the street or downtown or something, but it was the DJ dropped a needle on a record and it was recorded. These were recorded in Nashville. Um, they recorded a live show and then sent these records out to various radio stations to play. So though that's a transcription oh, disc, wow. not for sale for the public, but yeah. sent out. Oh, that's fantastic. And, and Sometimes they're pressed. That would only, I, I can't imagine they're pressed too many of them. No. But a lot of times you see them I guess if it's an acetate, I guess you could still be a, an acetate transcription disc. 
Um, well, some were only meant to play once, right? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and I think most of these were because they they were essentially commercials. Yeah. You know. And I guess uh, should I say what an acetate is? Do we know what an acetate is? A lacquer. Yeah. Um, I've got one here. I've got a really bad one here. This is what you don't <laughs> want to see an acetate. So where the the lacquer comes oh. off. Oh, that's that delaminating. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's really bad. A, a piece of aluminum with paint on it is basically. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, Lance, maybe you could drop in here and talk a little bit about your 78 project, too, because I know that's another part of what Dust to Digital does. That's well, let me, let me, before you do that, I want to say, because, um, Stuart, what you were saying about um, we find uh, recordings that haven't been heard, Lance goes so far back to get commercial recordings from the 20s and 30s and 40s that have been heard, but you know, it's been generations. So it's all still new to our ears. Right, right, right. That's right. Yeah, um, I, guess, I guess it was probably about, about nine years ago um, when the record industry was sort of, you know, changing and, and getting smaller, you know, a lot of great projects. Of course, if uh, somebody came like, like Cheryl mentioned and came to us with a Hank Williams, uh, idea that that would be different but a lot of people were coming to us with projects that were like not really commercially viable and so we started to think like these are really important these need to be documented but how do we do that do that and not go bankrupt and so we came up with the idea to start this uh a nonprofit organization called music memory and what we uh initiated with music memory was a digitization uh, project of old 78s, like Mike said. And uh, we sort of have let the collectors be our guide. And so what we'll do, um, and we're the only, the only organization I know that does this, we will go into the collector's home, uh, set up a digitization uh, rig in the uh, collector studio, and we will digitize their collection. Um, it's been really great because um, even though like the Library of Congress and certain universities digitize records, there are certain records that collectors will never let out of their record room. <laughs> um, and so we're able to get access to some of these. And um, it's uh, even though it's a virtual archive, it's uh, it's grown to over 50,000 recordings. And um, we uh, are continuing to, to document and digitize. We also scan the labels. So we have high resolution audio and the high resolution image of the label for all these recordings. So what kind of record would someone not let out of their room? <laughs> um, one collector I know, um, <laughs> after we digitized the records, he sold four records for $240,000. Those aren't, those aren't going on the back of a pickup truck to the Library of Congress. No. Amazing. Those are singles. That those are singles. That's a seventy-eight, but it's one song on each side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He sold eight eight songs for two for 30, 30 grand a song. Wow. Yeah. You know, um, this is an interesting thing because there's a real important part in the process of talking to artists or estates or managers about what to do with their collections. Usually, what happens is once they realize they have all these assets they start getting nervous about the monetization part of the archive, you know, how or the commercialization part of the archive. And one thing that I've always stressed and tried to stress through, the, through all of the uh, work that I've been doing is that they need to sort of think about it as two separate processes. One's the preservation of the assets and the second part is the commercialization of the assets and that they should not get those two mixed up and, and, and combine them. Because a lot of times you have assets that the ownership is in dispute. You know, who owns this particular tape? What label was the artist signed to at this particular moment? But that really shouldn't stop the artists or labels or managers from doing the preservation work because the assets, as we all know, um, degrade over time. Yeah. Um, as Michael just showed you that 78, which is delaminating and falling apart, these things can degrade over time. So that's something that has been really key in my um, uh, 
going forward with trying to get artists, managers, record companies to work on collections. Well, what's the, um, what's the concept for, like, obviously you must talk about how, like, for instance, Stevie, you, you, you remix all this Bob Dylan stuff. You're not just archiving it, you're actually listening to the multi-tracks. But an artist, and he's alive, so obviously there's permission for it. But I, I remember, you know, after Hendrix passed away, you know, a couple of great records came out, you know, um, Cry of Love and that, that he was working on. But then from that point on till now, there's been all this music that's come out of his that perhaps he didn't sanction and didn't think he wanted people to hear. Does that ever come up like, hey, since this wasn't released, and I'm talking about for people who are no longer with us, um, like, um, is it, you know, is it all fair game? I mean, I know Prince had his, their issues with his catalog, but is pretty much anything that exists fair game for putting out? Well, you have to, the ownership's very important. You can't just put something out there, you know, I mean, Columbia goes through great lengths to do these copyright collections on outtakes and stuff. They just release them in Europe just so they can control the copyright so someone else <clears throat> can't make money off a, of, you know, the Bob Dylan who was sneezing in the bathroom when someone recorded it, you know, and, and put it out there. Right. So, uh, you know, they'll go to great lengths to protect, you know, to protect the value of their catalog, you know. So depending on what, what state of affairs all these artists have left their stuff, uh, so who owns the Hendrix catalog? Who controls? There's got to be some control, and hopefully, you know, it's not just a free for all. Like, hey, you find the record. Hey, can I put this out? No, you can't. Really. Yeah, no. yeah that's a you know that's a really that's a conundrum. Yeah. Yeah. So I've I've done a lot of work in the last five years with Errol Garner's collection, right? And you right. know, I think the 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 short answer is that there has to be a quality threshold, right? You have to sort of set a threshold that represents the quality of work that the artist did when the artist was with us. And well, is that subjective? Eh, I don't know. Maybe yes. Maybe no. We could we could argue about that. But but you do have to set some sort of real quality threshold and say, okay, this take he's fuck. Excuse my language. He's brilliant on. Can you curse on Zoom? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> fucking so, you you know you say on this take he's fucking brilliant and and great and then you'll hear another take where he he might be having trouble executing or the bass player is having trouble executing so you really do need to honor the quality of the music that they created while they were here um and you so, know I, admit, I, I was just curious. That's why you're kind of producing as well. Yeah, I mean, putting the, the Garner collections together has really been fascinating because, you know, there's so much work uh, that he did that was unreleased. And, you know, there's almost 7,000 reels of Garner recordings. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the curation of the archive and the figuring out of what it is the public should be uh, to get to here is a really, really difficult part of this process. I have a really great partner in this, Peter Lockhart. He's a really uh, 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 amazing at doing that. And um, we'll go take a deep dive and come up, you know, a month later with, you know, 24 tracks to listen to and stuff. Right. Um, but yeah, this is a difficult thing to say. And I know, um, I work with a number of collections where uh, the artists don't want anything or, or in the future or, or now to be released. Right. But you still, you still trans, you, you transfer, I mean, you, you, you archive them for sure, right? You archive everything. Yeah, we really try to do the preservation work on all of the collections and we do them um, 24, 192 is what, Michael and I have been doing to wow. making preservation copies. Um, sometimes we'll do 2496 for people. Um, uh, we also, while we're doing the transfers, we're doing a whole bunch of work in organizing the collection. 
And we've developed, at, a, at the risk of being too geeky, we've, we've put together a whole bunch of metadata systems so that people can search through their own music. Right. Yeah? Wow. So, so because you, you have this collection of, of tapes and music and assets, um, and it's really important that you give the clients a way that they can listen to and search through all of this music. Um, and that's something that we've developed. Like in the case of the Errol Gardner stuff, like what is, what's the sensation when you're sitting there putting on a reel of tape that maybe no one has ever heard before? It's thrilling. Right. I mean, it's crazy. And, you know, it's always, um, you know, it's always this moment where I, I sit there with Peter and I'll say, I don't understand why this didn't make it on the record. Right. You know, that's sort of like one of the thresholds we have, right? So if we say that, it's like, how could this not have been on the record? Then we feel like, oh, we, you know, this deserves to, to be out in the public. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I think in general, going through that, an archive of that size, um, the same thing, it, it, you know, right now I'm working on a Blondie project uh, and I have been for many years. Because <laughs> uh, as uh, we know, Blondie was on a lot of record companies. Right. I was gonna ask, how long does this stuff take you to do? I mean, 6,000 Errol Garnet tapes. I mean, how do you- It even... took us two years. I had six Magic Shop, five Magic Shop engineers, I think, working on it. it took almost two and a half years to do the full collection. And those were, they would be at the studio, like while John was upstairs, because we worked on Garner when John would be upstairs. Oh, wow. So John would be upstairs mixing the whole steady or something. And then we would be downstairs in three different places uh, doing Garner transfers. And then who funds this, Steve? Like who pays everybody? Is it the Garner people or is it a record company? Um, in the, in, the, in the case of the Garner uh, collection, the Garner estate paid the magic shop. Um, although when it gets to the point where the record company becomes involved, um, that changes a bit. Right. I don't know, maybe Cheryl, you could jump in a little bit about that, but. Well, I, you know, it's, it's, it's great when um, the archiving process can meet the commercialization because uh, that can help cover some of the archiving, right? right? So with some estates or labels that I work with, I try to put together um, an initial provisional product plan and run a PNL against the archive, right? Against the archiving of it. So they know that, you know, not only may it, if you're fortunate, pay for itself to, to be archived, um, but that it might actually throw off some cash too. Um, and there, there's, there's ways of doing that. It just, um, you know, when, when you get to something as deep and wide <laughs> and long as the Garner stuff, you know, I don't, right. I don't know that there's an endless commercialization of all of that material, but, um, hopefully, you know, you can produce some, um, records that are successful enough to cover a good deal. That, that won a Grammy, right? Yeah. The Garner stuff. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we got nominated. I lost, I lost to the okay. Beatles. So, Everybody, we are always losing to the Beatles, man. <laughs> wherever they are. Yeah, awesome. yeah raise your uh, hand if you've or, lost to the Beatles. Uh, Beatles, Bob, or Miles. Yeah, mm -hmm. Ugh, whatever. <laughs> um, you know, one thing also about the Garner thing is that the music now lives at the University of Pittsburgh. That's another part of this whole archive oh, puzzle that lots of times... To, for safekeeping sake and for future, um, uh, you know, future use by students and future research into an artist, their collections end up at universities. Um, and so happily, all of those tapes and photographs and paperwork associated with Garner live at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, hey, hey, Steve, how do you even figure out a budget for these things. I mean, you have these boxes of tapes. I know what's happened to me in the past. I did a Ravi Shankar collection once and we counted the boxes of tapes and I figured, you know, about how much time it would take and I'm into it. And then I get to these tapes and all of a sudden 
their half speed and quarter track on both sides. And all of a sudden, you know, what I thought was an hour now takes three hours. Right. You yeah. know, there's 20 of them, <laughs> you know, and it's like, oh dear, you know. And yeah. You know, I mean, I had to go back to them and said, this is going to take a lot longer. But ha- I mean, 6,000 arrow garnet tapes is like three bucks a tape. What are you doing? <laughs> you know, it's crazy. I, I can't yeah. Even uh, so we have a, a, what's the thing called that we use, Michael? Your, your spreadsheet? I just made this estimator spreadsheet with all kind of variables i've been working on it as hell since i started you know every time i do a project and i get bit in the ass like what you're talking about steve you know i'm like okay i gotta put this in remember this for next time so i don't get screwed so we we try to have those variables all built in but still sometimes yes if it's a few tapes that are like six hours instead of one we'll suck it up but if it's a lot sometimes sometimes we can go back to the client and say look this is this is a lot longer than we think it's, it was. So yeah. no, sometimes was they'll, they'll, they're, they're, they they're cool with it and they'll pay more. Sometimes they have a specific money that they got granted or given and that's it. So right. we just. But that's one why thing, it pays, I'll, one that's why it pays to be sorry. a state. Sorry. No, I, yeah. I was just going to say, but that's why it kind of pays to be a stakeholder in the project too. Right. Because, um, you know, I've had projects that went almost, two decades before coming out that I would work on over time. And, but that's on me, right? It's not like I'm, I'm having to budget my time for somebody else because, and, and then working with the people on this call, you know, it's just like, we all go the extra mile, right? If it's not just a business transaction, if, if you're a stakeholder in this, then you, 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 you know, when you find that the tape runs backwards at a different speed and you didn't know something was, you know, you just do it, <laughs> you know, you just have to bite it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one thing to also to do, Stuart, is that <clears throat> we try to do hand counts. Yeah. I mean, we really try to look at the assets before we right. track for it. And I try to get them to give me speed and give me time and give me length. I'm forever asking if they're 10 inch reels or 14 inch reels or- 15 um, IPS, 30 IPS, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, is there Dolby, is there not Dolby? I try to get as much information, but you're right. I mean, sometimes you don't. And right. and sometimes you get, um, you get sometimes- well, this, this last collection we worked on, Steve, we still, you know, the, the people, who are counting these these items sometimes don't have the knowledge that we have. So, and sometimes more than more than others, but we got one, I think it was about 50 tapes that were marked as just half inch tapes. And we thought, great, we can do that. Well, we pull them out and they're, they're uh, Mitsubishi X86, HR, right? What do they make like 10 of those machines? So- uh, you remember that machine, John? Yes, I do remember that machine. Yeah, the is HR, right? not just the X86, this is the HR that goes to 96K. But Steve, is that why you bought that machine for transferring? Yeah, well, I bought a, a 3348 and a 3324 for for doing transfers for David Byrne because he had a bunch of, uh, of assets like that. So I bought that. Mm. Uh, so far, we haven't been able to find an X. What is it? What the hell do we need? X- Mitsubishi. I can't believe I remember the X86 HR. Yeah. So if any of your watchers, listeners, that's one that works. Hey, speaking of speaking of watches, there's a couple of things that have come in. Um, well, one of them was that uh, from Tino, our buddy Tino over at Power Station Avatar, a good friend of ours. Um, he said that Errol. Errol Gardner Steinway is sitting in a consignment shop in Long Island. Yeah. Uh, used to be at NOLA Studios, but that uh, it's actually his piano that's out there. But yeah, I know. It's possible. We made a bid on it. You did, really? Yeah, we put a, th- tell him thank you. And yeah, we put a bid on it, but you know, as soon as it gets associated with an artist, the price gets a little wackadoodle. Right. So we'll see what happens, but yeah. And a couple other things that have come in along the, the, the basic subject. I think a lot of people want to know how, like, what's the steps to restore audio quality? You know, are there ways to deal with distortion, um, damaged audio? Are there ways to do that? Well, why don't we, why don't we divide this up between Steve and Michael? Because yeah. Steve 
would get the first crack at like the multi, right? And it, obviously Steve does an incredible job on all the Bob stuff. Maybe he could talk a little bit about issues that he had with Bob and then maybe Michael could talk about what he has to do with the restoration part of the damaged audio. Well, I've, I've been, I've had it easy because I, I don't get handed tapes. I just get handed the 9624 files. So, you know, our job is, is first of all, making sure what we have, identifying takes, figuring out, you know, was this, was this the master that was used on the album? Are we going to remix that or are we going to leave that alone? So a lot of it is going through that kind of process for us in the beginning, just especially when we did the cutting edge, which was turned out to be 450 cues that I wound up mixing. There were thousands of mixes we did and just keeping track of, of which ones. And this version is from that day. And then they went and did it again five days later and then trying to make sense of all that. Um, so my job there was to you know, present the mixes, present the performances, however, However, they were. My job was not to fix anything. My job was to present it, you know, but to try to oh, present it. Right and to it. What? Is, look at that. Wow. Thank you for your handiwork. <laughs> what happened? Did you miss that? Oh, she was showing the Bob Dylan box. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh I, I didn't see that. Okay. But, uh, yeah, um, but anyway, yeah, so it became more of climbing a mountain, the mountain of Bob Dylan over that and keeping track of it all and, and making. Uh, you know, making choices. Yeah, okay, the bass player didn't know that note. We'll just duck them there. You know, we didn't go in and say, oh, let's move the bass note. We didn't, we didn't do that kind of stuff. But we just tried to keep it, you know, as real as possible. Um, and then, you know, and the final product was was this collection of, of all these takes that no one has heard. So it was, you know, of course, fascinating and great to hear. And a couple of tracks, you know, you never know who showed up in the studio. But that was more the process that we went through with the Bob Dylan stuff. So it wasn't like I had damaged tapes to deal with or anything like that, or I was, you know, taking clicks and pops out and stuff like that. Uh, you know, of course, I, I I made Bob sound as good as I could. I, you know, they they didn't. I don't think the pop filter was invented back then. So every P that he sings, you know, I was going after as plosives and stuff, and just to clean it up because when you, you listen to the original, uh, even like a Rolling Stone, you know, it's like there's plosives all over that thing, you know, but. Um, so, you know, we go in and clean up stuff like that just to make it more listenable. And I think that that has a big effect on the overall thing. Like all of a sudden, there's not these artifacts in there anymore. And you can control that without screwing with the, you know, the, the integrity of the track and what he was doing. So that, Evie, are you saying that Bob doesn't have good uh, mic technique? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> when you blast the harmonic into a 67 two inches away, <laughs> what, do you, what do you think you get? <laughs> What do you think but, you get, you know? Well, basically yeah. the, the quality of the, the quality of the transfers, all the audio, the audio aspect of it was. That was, was done already and it's done very well. And they're very careful. And there was one or two reels where I put them up and I went, this doesn't sound right. You know, it's just, I'm not getting, it just wasn't all there somehow. And, uh, you know, we went back and we, you know, Sony's amazing. Oh, can you just, you know, can you try another transfer on this? It was an older one, you know, it was, maybe it was older converters maybe it was you know 88 two with older converters maybe it didn't sound so good so uh they did it again you know they pulled the tapes and they re re retransferred and it came back and it was so much better right you know? so you got to make those calls like you know yeah you can try to eq this make it sound better but no it, it's going to come out much better if it's done right the first time so you know just just knowing and i guess that was from doing so many of them was like this one doesn't sound as good and we can let's see if we can get it better if we can't then it's all we have you know, it did, it did work a couple of times where we, we did. Not not too often, though. Right. I was convinced, oh, no, it was a digital transfer from the 90s. We have to do it again. But some of those stuff sounded very fine. It was fine, you know, good enough. So right. that, was, that was good. Michael, you want to talk a little bit about what you did? They want, they're interested oh. in knowing about sort of the tools that he uses. Right, right. Well, Bro, yeah, also awesome. like what's, what's the worst, like, situation you've had to fix? Or, you know what I mean? Like, what what is a typical... There's a, there's a lot, and it just depends on the medium, right? So, you know, removing pops and clicks is the story of my life, right? So a lot of the projects I work on with Lance, um, let me use just a basic example of working from, you know, most of us in the pro audio world, we think of working with tape or something like that. The work I do, so tape, when was tape invented? Late 50s or, or late 40s, right? Didn't come in the real, so everything before that, 
you know, we had, there was a big music industry, but it was all to disc, direct to disc. So if, if Lance is working on a project and from you know, recordings from the 30s and 40s, we can't go back to the tape. We got to go back to the commercially issued 78, excuse me, 78s. You know, if you don't know what a 78 is, this is a 78, it was a Fats Waller. It's basically a single, it's a 10 inch single. Um, so the transfer, the, tra it, the restoration starts with the transfer. Um, it's the same, um, like if you're recording vocals and your mic is fucked up, you're never gonna be able to fix that. You can try to fix it later on, but you're better off just getting a good mic. Same with transferring. Make sure you have the right needle to get the best sound off of that record and while minimizing as much as the surface noise as possible. Everything I do, I'm trying to separate. I'm trying to get this performance that's locked onto this imperfect medium. I'm trying to separate that and get the listener as close to the performance as I can. In the, so, case, in the yeah. case of the stuff you do with Lance, like, do you just accept one disc or do you go and look for multiple discs and find the best quality? Sometimes there's multiple. Sometimes because of like Lance was, Lance was explaining earlier about the Music Memory Project, he has key um, relationships with, with these amazing uh, uh, collectors. So even though a record is super rare, sometimes I'm fortunate and I get maybe two copies to choose from. Sometimes there's only one, one. I mean, Lance, how many projects have you worked on where there's like the only known copy in the world? And that's it, you just gotta make the best of it. Yeah, several, um, and, and unfortunately, like you're saying, Mike, uh, uh, most of the record labels back in the 20s and 30s, they did not keep masters, they, they all got tossed. And so it is, you're looking for the best condition of a commercially issued record that was on a store shelf in 1920 that's as, as thin as you can find it. Yeah. Most of the time, these records were well loved, well played. So there's a lot of surface noise on them. So from my pers from from me, I use a special needles to try to, like I said, to get the best sound off it. Then I've got I've got three choices I can choose because these are mono performances, and I'm transferring it with a stereo needle. I can choose the left side, the right side, or some of the two. And sometimes it, it there's no um, there's no one time. It, they're all good paths to go down. Uh, usually summing the left and right is you get a lot of noise reduction that way without without any kind of impact on the sound but so I always talk when I talk about this I people think of audio restoration as some of these great digital tools that we have the declicks and depops and de I think I think of audio restoration half of it is in the analog world you've got to your whole signal chain is, is, is critical and and if you can lessen the amount of digital work that you have to do you're better off. You're going to have less artifacts. You're going to, it's going to sound more natural. It's just going to be a better overall production at the end. Discover, I mean, we can get geeky. We can talk about the tools I use, but I mean, digital, I clean it up digitally. <laughs> but, but do you like also, is that like go with converters too? Do you have specific converters? Yeah, I like, I think it's all important, you know, and that was when I learned first, when I first started, I, I was transferring records. Then I was spending, you know, 10 hours on a three minute song and when you get to the end, you're like, God, why did I use this half-ass converter if I'm going to spend all this time? Again, let's make sure everything in the capture chain is just the best you can get. Right. Because, yeah, it all costs money, but you're going to, I'm going to spend so much time on the other side of this. Let's right. just try to make the analog to digital side top So notch. what's your converter of choice? I used to use a Prism 88XR. And now I moved over to uh, merging technologies. Uh, was it happy? I like it because it's it's great sounding, and the connectivity. It's it's just easily connected to different computers that I'm using. It connects um, over the uh, internet cable in your in your uh, in your studio. So it's great. I can plug it into a Mac. I can plug it into to a PC. I don't need any other extra card. I just plug in a cool. Ethernet cord, and it's there. And One thing that. Uh, I would like to talk about in terms of like the analog transfers, the tape transfers, is that I'm a, a really big supporter and believer in this system called the Plangent process. Mm. It's uh, Jamie Horth makes this thing. Uh, mm. um, and I've used it on a number of high profile projects. Uh, Woody Guthrie, the Stones, uh, this whole new set of Garner these 12 Garner records that we put out over the past year, every one of them used this plangent process 
when the tape was transferred. It's a way, at the risk of being geeky, it's, it's a way of tracking the bias on the original recording. And through the tracking of the bias, the plangent can fix wow and flutter and tape speed inaccuracies. Wow. And no pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so it's, an, it's, it's just crazy how well it works. And, um, uh, and of course, it's just crazy how crazy Jamie is. But whatever to that, it's really, really worth using because the result is astonishingly better. And when you hear the A and B between what we uh, are, uh, uh, give Jamie, the flat, and then what's been uh, plangent and finally speed corrected, the resolution of the piano is completely different. Mm -hmm. The harmonics of the piano are true and accurate. There's none of that high frequency wobble that you, you're used to getting on tape recordings of acoustic pianos from 1960 or 1964. It's much more like you're sitting in the control room and, and the artist is playing in the live room and you're hearing it through the speakers. Right. That's great. Sort of eliminating the, all of the ugly artifacts that the tape um, is creating. And you know, it's a funny thing because there are so many young engineers, right, who are in love with the art of, right? They, they worship the fucked up artifacts. And yeah, there's uh, a cassette plug in now, right? That just, just fucks up your sound. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, that's a whole thing, right? How, how many software companies right now making gobs of money degrading audio? Yep. <laughs> right? But, hey, I don't need a plug in to do that. I can do that on my own. <laughs> <laughs> just remember that. Okay. They're called MP3s. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I come down on the other, after all of these years of listening to analog tapes, I come down on the other side of it. Well, you know, know, it's funny that you mentioned that because, um, you know, I've done a lot of work with, uh, some of you guys know him, uh, with Vince Giordano, who's a, uh, you know, a, a guy who lives in the 1920s to this day. And so much of the work that I've done with him is for movies and for TV. And it's done so that it has, they want him because he's got the patina of that era, right? So, but when they hear a modern recording of that, they want to, like Steve, you're saying, they want to degrade it a little bit and get back to what it sounded like off of that medium back then. Uh, and Vince, who, all he does is listen to that music. He want, he doesn't want to hear that. He wants to hear it, like you're saying, like it's coming out of the room, someone's playing. He thinks that that is like one of the, he, the audio quality of the old music that he listens to is not, he's not a fan of that. He wants to hear it like he's playing it in a club and you hear it in the room. And so to your point, Steve, it's like he, I'm with you on wanting to hear it as good as possible. It's I, a I don't know who this guy is, but I yeah, love him. <laughs> the history of restoration work. If you think about where we came from, like in the in the 80s, right, where they had sonic solutions and they fucking no noised everything to death. Yeah. I remember when those first Elvis CDs came out, and for some reason they thought it was a good idea to cut off the endings, and <laughs> and you know, got, for God forbid, there was a little tape hiss on the end, so. <laughs> <laughs> we cut the endings off and and same thing with the beginnings god forbid there was a little air in the beginning <laughs> before the downbeat of the song so we we have to learn how to use the technology and not be overwhelmed by the technology yes and yeah. and you know i'm a firm believer that you need to keep the time stamp uh, is what i call it you know you, you should keep the time stamp of, of when the recording was made. It's yeah. foolish, you know, to try to pretend that this Garner record was not made in 1962. I just want as many of the anomalies that we've created after he played right. eliminated. Right. right. You know what I'm saying? Aging of it all, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Totally, when I'm removing like 
pops and clicks and noises like that from a record. I'm trying to get rid of the stuff that's on the medium. If, if, if a blues guitar sits down in a chair and it creaks, I'm not removing those, those creaking right. chairs, right? right? I want to remove the shit that's after that. Yeah. Right. I've also had to arm wrestle with artists when, you know, um, oh, who yeah. want to remix everything that they did back in the day. And um, yeah, I'm a, if it was mixed in 1971, I feel like, you know, honor the artist that you were in 1971 you know, right. and because it's not going to sit alongside the rest of that record from 1971. If it's got a 2019 mix, it's going to sound like crap. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm with you all the way. It's like you got to keep it as as authentic to the intent and the period as possible. Yeah. So speaking of 1971, Cheryl, mm -hmm. I saw that you did a band box. Yeah. And so um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm sure we're all big fans, but was the, did you find stuff that nobody had heard before? Yeah, um, tons of stuff. I think we probably went through every inch of tape that they ever recorded. Really? Uh, we, we went through uh, the reissues and then also it, it all, the whole campaign kind of culminated after about a decade with that box set. So, um, you know, we found all kinds of things. And, um, you know, one of my favorite things to do in finding things that not a lot of people have heard since they were first recorded was uh, um, when I get to take that back to the artist and surprise them. Uh -huh. And, you know, uh, I, do you know the song Twilight? Oh yeah, sure. Okay, so they put that on the, uh, it was a single off the best of the band. It was sort yep. of a right. toss away, sort of faux reggae thing. Right. And I always thought the lyrics were great, but the that particular recording just completely missed the intent of the song I so I, I was always bugging Robbie and and um about about you know didn't you guys try this a different way because this kind of this sucks you know and he's like <laughs> yeah we never quite got it right and and I said well is there like a straight ahead rock version because I think so and so you know as we dug we found one and, and it kind of sucked you know it didn't quite get it um but then um he, he led us into his storage locker and I pulled out a whole bunch of cassettes. And um, I, you know, I listened to every last bit of every tape. And, um, you know, I, I had this one tape popped in and it was, it was blank, it was blank, it was blank. I was filing records or something. And um, all of a sudden I heard, you know, play and record go down. I heard somebody light a cigarette and put a lighter on a piano. And very quietly, Robbie played Twilight. Jeez. And and I, I was like, that's the song, right? So I took it back to him and I said, um, Robbie, I don't know if you're gonna like this, but I think this is what I've been after. And I played it and it, you know, he just kind of sat there and he's kind of an imposing kind of figure, right? He's Robbie Robertson and um, very quiet. And finally he went, Cheryl, that's awesome. <laughs> and I was like, oh. <laughs> and we, you know, we got to use it on the box and, oh. and he liked it so much that he sent it to Jerry Lee Lewis. And when Jerry Lee cut Last Man Standing, he based his version on of that song that he covered partially on, on the demo that, that right. we had found. So, okay. um, you okay. know, it's, that, that kind of stuff is, is all, all and, fun. And was there a, um, was there a, a song out of the blue? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, so, it's last waltz. That was on the last waltz, but you know that was one of these. I, I'd, I'd never heard it on the last waltz, and a very similar to you, I let it, it run on like whatever the last. It's, is it the last song on the last waltz? Um, well, it's last waltz waltz song. I think is the last one, but yeah. But it's, <laughs> sort of. but it's not the band, right? And and I don't, I can't find any credits that say who. I mean, it's Robbie. It, it, this is, if you guys haven't heard this, this is an unbelievable recording. Um, and it's one of the most amazing songs, but I got a feeling, I don't know if you know any history on it, but was it done post Last Waltz? Like, Yeah, there were some things done. Um, you know, there, there were artists that couldn't show up and be there like Emmy Lou and Staples. That's why they're shot in right. the way that they are. And so I think that there were some sessions done um, afterwards to, to capture some things. And, you know, then they were cutting the film and mixing the audio and all kinds of stuff. So 
um, I can't remember exactly uh, when that stuff was recorded, but Out of the Blue is one of those tracks that was recorded. Because it's it, it to me, it's uh, I won't go any further, but it sounds like Garth is on it and Robbie is on it. Yeah. And it almost is a point where I go, is that Richard Manuel's voice or is that Robbie? And well, remember right after that, Robbie was starting to do a lot of music for film. Right. And um, there are recordings that are essentially the band that show up on some of those soundtracks that happened right around the same time. Uh -huh. So, you know, all of the musicians were sort of in that you know, they were swimming around still together, doing stuff, working on these projects, so. And what was the quality of all the recordings? Like the multi-tracks that you got? Oh, they were, they were fine, they were great. I mean, they were either at uh, Bearsville or in the Capitol Archives. And, um, you know, they, they were, uh, we, took a, we took a trip up to Bearsville and um, went through a bunch of the stuff that they, they had up there. Um, when it was open, it was a beautiful place. I'm oh, sorry yeah. that place is gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, everything was in pretty good shape, you know, except for the um, the stuff I was digging out on cassettes and wonky things like that. Did anything get remixed or it just got remastered? Um, well, you know, uh, Robbie and I uh, had had that particular impasse. Right. Uh, but he, um, you know, there were things that we had to mix because they hadn't been mixed back in the day. Right. And then things that were mixed back in the day, we left as they were. Right. Awesome. It's cool. It's fun. I have a question, which um, maybe you guys can help me get to the bottom of, or there's always been this kind of, or not urban audio legend of when the music business went over to CDs and a lot of collections got remastered. Is it true or false that some of the collections, I won't name the band's names like The Who and stuff like that, but their early CDs didn't sound great because they were using the wrong masters or Dolby masters and not using the Dolby. Is that true or to any of you guys' knowledge or is that false? Well, I mean, I don't know about The Who collection, right? So I, I can't really speak to that. But in general, the answer to that is yes. And, and the reason is, is because in the early days, there wasn't a lot of search, proper searches for what we like to call the source master, right? You have to think about um, how many copies of that analog mix down two track were made and sent all over the world to different pressing plants, right? And a lot of times uh, the original might get lost or mislaid. And so they would end up using one of the copies. The that safety. We called them safeties in the 80s. Safety. Yeah. Right. Um, or protection. And, um, I think th the answer to your, the short answer is yes, but I think it wasn't done maliciously. I think it's really done because you have to be like a bulldog to get to the sources. I mean, Terry Landy, you were talking about Terry Landy, right? And because she does the Stones archive and also she did Spectre's archive. I mean, there's nobody who's more of a bulldog than Terry Landy about getting source masters for the Stone stuff. Um, and it's a very difficult process because um, a lot of the the assets themselves, people don't know where they are, right? Mm. They, they're lost to time. So sometimes you have to uh, end up using uh, um, inferior, you know, copies and stuff, but it's not by choice in any no. way. Right. When, I, when I was at Sterling in the 80s, which is when we switched over to CDs and all of a sudden we were pushing 16 pens around you know, the way records were manufactured around the world was just what Steve was talking about. There were many, we had the master that the actual acetates were cut for America, probably. And then um, a lot of the tapes, EQ, EQ copies, you know, basically of what the mastering was, what we called them, were sent around the world for cassette, you know, manufacturing in Europe, uh, mass, you know, more records being cut there. 
And so you don't know at a certain point when a CD has to be reissued and the Netherlands, you know, needs more that they, they grab a tape and all of a sudden they're cutting a CD from a, you know, a, a, a tape that's not, not first generation, not the master and right. on, maybe on questionable playback material, you know, playback equipment that maybe isn't even aligned right. So yeah, there was, it, it was a big problem. You know, and I think a lot of the stuff got bad name because of that, because it wasn't, it's hard to keep track of the whole world like that. I think also uh, the engineers had to learn how to master for the new technology and the new medium. You know, whether, whether you had a, a de-protection copy or the stone cold original assembled master, you know, you kind of had a, I mean, you tell me, but you had a little bit of a wider playing field uh, as far as the, the, the soundscape is concerned, right? And so, but I also think that, you know, not understanding the new technology afforded by a CD, they just took, what I, what I saw was just a lot of tapes, slap them down, you know, transfer them to 1630, send the 1630 to the plant, the plant spins it off at eight times the speed, you know, you're losing ones and zeros all over, making the glass master and, you know, voila, you have a CD. And, uh, you know, at a certain point, um, probably maybe 20 years ago, and, and seriously, engineers tell me, it felt to me like everybody finally got a grip and, and went, oh, I, we understand now what we're dealing with. We should go back to the original assembled master and, you know, capture it at, at, at the highest rate possible and then work from that, you know, because for years I just saw, it's just sort of like, okay, pull a master, get it out. You know, because remember, there was a lot of money to be made in the 90s. Yeah. Everything that we could put on a shiny silver disc would sell. Mm -hmm. yeah. Brilliant. So, so there, the, the, there wasn't, I think sometimes there wasn't as much care as, as could have been. And I, I was in an area called Special Markets at the time. We were selling records in Pottery Barn and Avon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was like, ship them out and ship as many as you can because people were buying them. So you know right. god knows where the masters were coming and i also from. i also think you know the mastering engineers at that point like you said sure were learning how to even make a cd master yeah. and and when you listen to the early cds they're so quiet compared to what we're doing now the, the you know the volume war is yeah. around yeah but we were trying to get it to sound somewhat like the lacquer we were you know playing it wasn't close really we knew it but we were you know we were doing the best we can and the early 1610s weren't as good as 1630s and you know, we used to sit down and watch the error correction light going on and say, wow, it's making up its own words, you know? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so it's like, okay, you know, but that was, that was the height of the technology and, and right, you couldn't, you couldn't manufacture them fast enough. So that was, uh, you know, the beginning CDs were rough and it gave digital a bad name right from the beginning, you know? Yeah. But I do remember hearing for the first time when I bought the CD, American Beauty, the Grateful Dead record, mm -hmm. It sounded fantastic. I'd heard things that I hadn't heard, but like I heard the harmonies in a different way. And I mean, I hate to go back, but like there were a couple of Who records I just remember listening to and going, it doesn't sound good. You know what I mean? I just, it was a bummer. I just, and I love those records too as a kid on vinyl. So it, it, it was interesting because I knew there was a difference, you know, at like, you know, with 31 years old, I said something was going on. I just didn't know what it was. But, but I, people have mentioned that, you know, Dolby uh, safeties, but not running from Dolby by accident and mm -hmm. just stuff like that. And I didn't know if that was really true or just like, you know, people like making this shit up. It still happens though, right? I mean, Steve and I, we're working on a project where I think, you know, everybody on this call, we all love music. We all love, we all want to produce the best thing that we can, but sometimes you're up against somebody else who doesn't know. So they supply us with inferior tapes. But Steve, we, you know, Steve was looking for an analog copy that we, it was cut in the seventies and they supplied him with, what was it tape? Uh, Steve, they ran off a of 1630 oh, yeah, to a they, tape and you gave know, you that. During this whole thing and Universal was, was pretending they didn't burn tapes. They sent oh. me a, a 1630 copy on an analog tape. <laughs> so they, and they, the amazing thing is they took the time to <laughs> edit the two track tape. Right, they put leaders between the songs, and uh, Matt Boynton called me up. John, you remember him, right? Who? Matt Boynton. Oh yeah, of course. 
yeah, Matt called me up and he said, you better, you better fucking come to the studio because you're never going to believe what this is. <laughs> and, and so I ran out to Brooklyn and it was so clearly it had a digital glitch, you know, it had a, 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 a glitch that couldn't have been created. So, yeah, I mean, it's a very difficult thing when you're trying to source, uh, you know, find the correct source tape. Um, and most of the preservationists and the archivists who work at the, at the label archives are really trying to do a, a, the best job that they can. You know, I've had a really great relationship with the people at uh, Universal dealing with this Blondie stuff. And they've been amazingly helpful to me. And I, I complain a lot and I say no a lot. And they, they go back and they give me other stuff and they try to find the stuff that really is the source master. But um, yeah, the original, original CDs, you know, a lot of it was also not uh, being married to the original. Like if you're gonna do who's next, you probably want to find the source master, but also you probably want to find the an original pressing, right? That did Greg do that? I, I don't know who. Probably either Greg or Bob Ludwig did that, right? So you probably want to find the first pressing, and that's probably what you want to listen to when you're thinking about working on a new version of that, right? Mm. I have an interesting question for you guys from, from a fan uh, uh, watching. Um, and I'll let one of you guys feel this. Can you play back a 16 track tape on a 24 track head, a eight track tape on a 16 track head or a three track on a four track head? Who would love to feel this one? Steve Rosenthal? Yeah, I mean, you shouldn't. You really shouldn't because if you're paying the two inch 16 track, uh, 24 track uh, um, head you're not getting the full bandwidth of the 16 track and that goes for all of those other format things so yeah you can play the 16 track 2 inch tape on a 2 inch 24 track head but please don't <laughs> you, you should I mean you know some people can't afford the, the rental money for the head stack right or to buy the freaking head stacks because they're really expensive, right? Right. You guys have all of them separately and you just change them when you want to do transfers? Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Hey, so I, I got a question for, for Lance because we're, we're talking about like, um, you know, the Stones and Bob Dylan and the band and, and contemporary, you know, very popular records. And you seem to be doing a deep dive for more obscure stuff. And how often do you run across artists that you've never heard of? Hmm. Or do you, or, or you just, you know, what's out there and it's not a surprise, but do you ever go, wow, I've never heard of this person and it's amazing. And it still happens. I mean, <clears throat> the label sort of came out of my radio show when I was a college radio DJ. And I took over, a friend of mine was graduating and he did a show of music from the 20s and 30s. And, uh, you know, I went out and, you know, got turned on to the Yazoo reissues and county records and all these great blues, jazz, country records from the 20s and 30s on reissue labels. And um, when I started, like Mike was saying, I ended up connecting with a lot of uh, 78 collectors and that really opened my world up. I mean, I did not know that much music had been recorded during that era. It was like a big boom that, you know, the reissue shelves at the, at the record stores didn't tell ha even half the story. Um, but over time, I made my way through a lot of these record collectors' uh, collections. And now, you know, I think probably the things that come to us um, would be like the things that, that, you know, like you're saying, the things that you don't ever, you've never heard of these artists, it would be like from archives or maybe, uh, you know, people who made field recordings, um, maybe that never even came out on record. That's where you're probably going to hear most things now that, you know, that haven't been, I guess, heard before because they, ne they never were, were issued. Right. So, in archives gathering dust. So, so you're not really, it's not 
the popular music of the 20s and 30s that you're digging for. It's more the, you know, Alan Lomax, pre-Alan Lomax style. Um, I, I, I guess you could call it field recordings. Um, yeah, the yeah, Lomax, we've, we've actually done some projects with the Alan Lomax archive and, and several other people that made field recordings for the Library of Congress. Uh, we've issued some of that material. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think what we're trying to do is there's, there's these, these great artists like Hank Williams and, and Johnny Cash and The Who. And I think what we're trying to do is piece the puzzles together, the puzzle pieces together of the people that maybe they heard, you know, that, that never got the record deal for whatever reason, or, you know, I'm, we've put out some uh, musicians before where they, their families didn't even know they made records, uh, their kids. They made a 78 and just thought, yeah, that's, that was, that was fun and never thought twice about it. Um, so I think we're just trying to, you know, tell the full story of, of, uh, the, the musicians that for whatever reason, they, they made great recordings, but they, you've never heard of them. And, um, there's, there are still some out there. Is that like, um, when you sit down to listen to music, is that what you like to listen to besides being in the business of it? Is that something that is in your musical wheelhouse per se? Yeah, or? yeah I do. I, I love um, like the, the, you know, I grew up like when I first got into online radio, I, I got onto WFMU and, you know, a lot of uh, um, the DJs there play music you've never heard, but then uh, I've gotten turned on lately to NTS radio and they have, they call them mixtapes. There's di these different stations that are sort of, uh, curated uh, by genre and you'll hear stuff on there that you've never heard before. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm always trying to learn more, trying to, you know, make connections, trying to, to figure out like what, you know, what, what, what are all these musicians that, that we don't know their story, you know, what did they produce and, and um, does it relate to people in 2020? I mean, can we, can we learn something? Can we uh, feel something from something that, uh, that maybe just, for whatever reason, didn't didn't uh, didn't catch on, didn't find a huge audience. I mean, it's just so strange to me to think about certain artists how they got you know the, their their household names, and you'll hear uh, an artist you've never heard of, and, and they're better. And then you just you know sometimes it makes your uh, your brain kind of hurt a little, and wondering why. Well, bless you for uh, for keeping that stuff alive. Oh, no, it's it's a passion. I, I really love to do it. Um, and it's uh, it's it's what keeps me going. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, anybody want to talk about anything else or plug anything or or uh, tell a funny joke or. <laughs> Can I say one thing? Wax cylinder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does anybody, is there any way to transfer that? Do you guys ever find one? Does anybody like give you a box of it? Like, I, I have no concept of what that might even be like. Vince Giordano has them. <laughs> and he plays them. We just made some to sell. You did really? Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Who, 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 who sells a player? Uh, don't know, but we made 10 Dom oh. Flemons um, cylinders. Wow. And, uh, that is fantastic. Yeah. I've, got, I've got a cylinder player. There and, uh, <laughs> actually, uh, you're, you're going to you need one of these. <laughs> I know. If the power goes out, you know, I can still play music. But um, <laughs> how is that possible? How does it work? You just wind it. It's a hand crank and it has a spring and plays, yeah. plays off the hand crank. No, but there's a, a UC Santa Barbara, actually. The University of California at Santa Barbara has a cylinder. Um, uh, it's, it's a transfer station, and I'm pretty sure it's done by laser. It yeah. doesn't ever touch the cylinder. Right. I have to say also, there's a, there's a label called Archeophone. Uh, uh, Richard Martin and Megan Hennessy, they're a couple and they own it. And, and they pretty much own, from my point of view, the, the whole cylinder playback and restoration game. Um, if I get if people give me cylinders occasionally, Richard Martin is the first person I call. Yeah, he's amazing at doing it. Yeah. The other thing about the cylinders, John, you know, you could take one of your bands to the Edison Museum in Jersey, and they'll record directly to a cylinder for you. 
Does that mean they have to learn how to play the songs once? Uh-huh. Yeah, and they can't fuck up because it's it's. Uh, we uh, we went to the Library of Congress a couple of years ago and had a um, a visit in Culpeper, Virginia, and we did some cylinder recordings at Culpeper with uh, Cold Quest, who's Woody's grandson. And they sang into the horn, and they did it directly to the cylinder. Really? You could bring the band. You could bring one of your rock bands to to, Wait, to the Edison factory. So, am- amplification doesn't fuck that up. Well, hmm. I mean, yeah, you'll have to figure out how far away to put the amps, or whether you want them to do an acoustic version of it. Right. Right. That makes more sense. Yeah, it's probably better to do like uh, you know acoustic guitars and. And that bass, that's like an acoustic bass, that's yeah, yeah. an acoustic bass, and hit hit like a box instead of the drums. But it's really fascinating to try to do it because you really have to sort of place them in right. the distance from the horn in order to get the right balance. Those videos are online, right, Steve? Yeah, you can yeah. see some of the videos of recording live to the cylinder at the Edison uh, wow. website and stuff. And I know they're looking, you know, John Crivet, right? I think he's been on yeah. your show, right? John is a, he, he helps them find people to record into the camp. Wow. And uh, they love doing like new music and new bands into the camp. Hang on, Lance is going downstairs to get a cylinder player. He'll crank yeah. it up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the moment I've been waiting for. <laughs> You know, in Culpeper, uh, when you go down in the dungeon where they keep all of the assets, it's the national repository for uh, so many of the, the irreplaceable music assets. They have temperature controlled vaults filled with original Edison cylinders. It's amazing. And, and trying to keep them and not trying, they successfully keep them, uh, you know, in a way where they can be played and can be transferred. Is that how, remember records we used to call them in the 70s and 80s, hot wax or something? Is that a derivative from the wax cylinder like age or any of that shit? Or is that just whatever? No, that's totally from that. It's also from 78s. You would, they would, in the early days of 78s, you would cut live to wax. Really? Yeah. And the same, same basic thing. You have this huge horn that you would stand, you've seen the pictures where you stand in front of and you try to just project as much as you can into the horn and it just right, right, right down and Cut into the Incredible. wax. And the yeah. great thing about 78 is, you know, 45, they're RPMs, right? It's 33 RPM, 45. So 78s are going fast. I mean, that is. Super fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You would think it would have a great signal to noise ratio, but the medium was so crappy that right. the speed doesn't help us out any. Yeah, I got a bunch of 78s from my parents that I got. We all do. <laughs> I had a bunch of them too. Uh, my, my kid doesn't have any. Set. Well, she might eventually. I'll take that. It sounds like those record at home cardboard acetate things. Yeah, I get so many of those. Oh, wow, so I remember very, those. That's crazy. Silver yeah. tone. Yeah. Well, it was I wonder, much. does the wire cylinder sound better than eight tracks or worse? Well, you got two things. You got wire, which Steve has... Uh, uh experience with then there's the cylinder eight tracks i don't know i probably would take a cylinder over an eight track here we go oh Oh, wow cool there we go wow go lance go now we got it happening (laughs) this is fantastic let's see here here's the crank all right hang on one second I'll be right back. It's going to be Just it. Don't worry. Just reboot it. It's going to be a honky tonk woman. Right. Carrie Grant and Catherine Hepburn. It looks like, who is that? That's true. If I if I go to Edison, Steve, with the band, I'm going to have to figure out where to put the cowbell player. Yeah, he'll have to be like, leave him home. In the back. You're in in the back. Leave him home. Yeah, he'll have to in teenage if you're in edison because <laughs> the horn loves you know mids it freaking right. loves mid frequencies oh yeah so the cowbell is going to be really freaking loud didn't we oh, have steve is- didn't we have cold quest when he was doing they had like on risers well he had the like the guys in the back yeah you, know, you want to get as close as as you can to the horn but then you have the horn is so big you could actually stack people so you want to like right. have risers 
Was, well, and you yeah. could have like I think the banjo guy was a little bit further back because of yep. the shrill nature that it'll right. cut through. Yeah. Keep the mid stuff in the back. Yeah. Vince would show yeah. some old uh, some old uh, film clips of bands actually moving, like a big band, right? They're set up, they're playing, and all of a sudden the trumpet player gets up, walks over, walks back, right. vocalist walks up. Yeah. That it's makes like sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess yeah. it was like a lot of that big band stuff with the vocalist where, right, you had to put the, there was one mic, so everybody would have to kind of, yeah. I mean, those videos, I mean, watching that stuff is fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mixing on uh, the fly. They would sort of have to self-balance, right? Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. So, so they, they only got one crack at it. So they would sort of have to self balance and the and band would self balance, right? Boy, is that a lesson in modern recording that if you can get a band in a room together mm -hmm. and actually do that, you know how much easier our jobs would be? <laughs> uh oh, there's the cylinder. Right, here we go. I want to get this. Buying guitars on the Edison cylinder label. Could you move the phone closer? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, that's great. That's so good. So the cylinders are grooved. They're basically like, you know, it's like a, it's like a 78 on a toilet paper roll. <laughs> there are grooves on the, on the, and then it just. Fabulous. I think, I, and I'm not sure, I think you can play like the same needle that plays, that can play a 78 can also play uh, a cylinder, but it's just a different setup. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> it sounds so cool. I mean, it's just. Wow. Sounds very clean, not a lot of pops and ticks in there. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That is so great. I think, that's, I think this one, I looked it up, it's a, like, recorded in 1902. Wow. <laughs> that is fantastic. Wow. wow, recording before DigiDesign. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can get Eventide to work on that. Yeah, a plug-in. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, cylinder plug-in. Plug <laughs> Just what we need. <laughs> hey, everybody, we're being asked to wrap up here. Oh, but shit. But I just really want to thank everyone for doing yeah, that was it. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for putting this together. This is a great group of people. And yeah. um, thanks for having me. Yeah, this was was great. Great. Super great fun. to meet everybody. See everybody. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Uh, great to meet the few that I haven't met before, right. but that was really yeah. fantastic. Yeah, yeah, likewise. Dude, the wax cylinder was so fucking good. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good thank thing to end on. Be well. Stay All right. Thank you. Thank you.